Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Majila, and good afternoon. Uh, colleagues, um, for today's workshop, we'll talk about the theoretical framework as well as uh, the conceptual framework. I will start with the theoretical framework, and my colleague, uh, Professor Ngulube, uh, will come in with the uh, conceptual framework. You'll agree with me that uh, for any research, one has to have a section on on um, theoretical framework, which uh, serve a very important role in in research. And for this presentation, um, I'll talk um, about um, the following. Firstly, I'll outline what a theoretical framework is, or what the theoretical framework is all about. And then I'll also touch on the key components of a theoretical framework. And then I'll also talk about how to write a theoretical framework. And then later I will provide an example by just picking uh, at least one theory and try to present it in a practical way just to see how one can um, handle this section in a, in a research. And let's start with the, the actual um, explanation of what a theoretical framework is. Um, I call it a foundational review uh, of an existing theory. So, so meaning one is to have a theory in mind or the existing theory in mind that will then serve as a roadmap for your study and that theory will at least assist one to develop arguments uh, that will assist with uh, achieving the objectives of a particular study. So uh, normally the theoretical framework, um, as a researcher, you need to explain um, the chosen existing theory and how will it support uh, the research in that particular study. Then let's quickly look at the key components of a theoretical framework. Um, firstly, you look at the purpose. You would try to outline the role of theoretical framework in, in research because um, before you get deep into what a theoretical framework is, and then it is also important just to try to outline uh, what is its purpose in a, in a research and then how does it assist one in, in, in when it applied in a, in a particular study. And then the second component is around the concepts and uh, definitions. So any study consists of the key concepts or the operational concepts. So the theoretical framework assists one to define those concepts. So when you define the concepts in this section, you are using the theoretical lenses to try to bring meaning to concepts that are guiding the study. What does those concepts mean in the context of your study? Then you use this theoretical framework or theoretical lenses to try to unpack the concept uh, to the understanding or to the context of a particular study. And then uh, you also look at um, the theoretical statement as part of the key uh, components of a theoretical framework. And then with the theoretical statement, uh, we need to know uh, what is the theory all about. Um, once you identify the theory, you need to unpack it for the reader to understand what is this theory all about, and then who came up with the theory, who is the author of the theory, and then what does the theory say, or what is this theory all about, and then you try to unpack it uh, to the understanding of the reader. And then the other key component of this theoretical framework is around the structure and the linkage. We need to see or you need to outline the relationship between the theory and the study. So, so uh, the theoretical framework, they are not universal. You need to choose the, th the theory that is in line with your study or that is related to your study. So as part of, um, conceptualizing this section or, 
or, or writing this section, the theoretical framework, we need to know the relationship between the theory and the study. How is this theory related to your study? You need to convince or you need to justify the relevancy of this theory because we need to be convinced that the theory is relevant to your study. So as a scholar or as a researcher, you need to bring some justification in this area to try to convince the reader that indeed this theory is related to the current study and then these are the, 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 the areas that you feel this theory fit well in that particular study. And then uh, the last key component of this uh, the theoretical framework is around assumption. So we need to know the influence of the chosen theory to the study. How is it likely to shape the study? Because at the end of the day, when you wear particular spectacles, for instance, you, ex you are expecting to, to, to see a particular view or to have a different view. So same as when you use the theoretical framework, you are using the lenses of that particular theory. And then we also need to know by look, using those lenses, how is this going to shape your study? How is it going to shape your, 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 your approach in terms of your data presentation, in terms of looking at issues that you are trying to investigate? So that's um, what assumption is all about. And then as we continue, uh, we also have uh, three papers of um, uh, theoretical framework. So the first one is around the organizing of a phenomena. So um, when you tackle the theoretical framework section, you also need to bring the problem statement of a particular study or the study that you are investigating. You try to unpack the problem using the theory. Um, you will be using those uh, theoretical lenses that I I spoke about, and then you try to organize that problem or that phenomena, giving us the, 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 the breakdown of the problem using the theory. How is it theory assist you to understand this problem better? And then how is it going to assist you to achieve the objectives that you set to achieve at, at a later stage? And then um, again, the, 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 the other purpose is that the theoretical framework also assists the researcher to be able to predict what will happen in the new situation. Uh, remember, when you conduct the study, you are conducting the study with the view of contributing the new knowledge in that particular space. So you also need to anticipate what is it that the theory is likely to influence in terms of changing the situation. Um, and then in the, in, the, in, the, in the research space, we'll talk about the objectives that one set to achieve. How is it likely to assist you to achieve uh, all those uh, objectives? And then again, it must also help you to generate the new research or the new body of, of knowledge. As you do the, the, the study, the theoretical framework should give you those lenses that will assist you to come up or to contribute something that um, can be of worth to the body of knowledge. Then let's quickly look at the actual way of writing the theoretical framework. Um, the first part is you need to identify your key concept or the key concepts within your study. So the first step is to pick out uh, the key concepts that are guiding uh, your study. And then one has to try to define them using those uh, theoretical uh, lenses. Um, you try to unpack and to make sense to, I mean, to, to the reader, what does those key concepts mean in the context of your study using that very identified um, theory. So we need to know that within this theory, and then this is how you unpack your concepts, and then this is what you attach meaning to them using all those uh, theoretical framework or theoretical lenses. So after discussing um, those different uh, models or theories, then one can establish uh, the definition that best fit the research or you justify why do you think this definition best fit your study. So that will be through uh, the perspective of that adopted uh, particular theory. 
that you then now look at uh, all those operational concepts and then you attach uh, a meaning to, to, to them. And then you can even combine um, different theories uh, from a particular field to try to build your own unique framework if maybe you feel like the theories that are available, they don't really, you know, uh, fit well in your study. Because remember, I spoke about the issue of justification, where you need to justify the relevance of the theory. So sometimes you find a student using more than one theory. So at times you may find that uh, maybe one theory addressed, ad ad only addressed a particular aspect of your study, it doesn't address your study as your whole. So that is why you then find some students try to bring several theories, maybe the main theory and also the supplementary theory, just to try to address the areas that uh, one feel like uh, the initial theory did not, you know, address uh, that particular aspect as a whole. So, so, so that's when one decide to use uh, more than uh, one theory, just to try to bring understanding in, in a particular context. And then uh, the second thing is that you also need to evaluate and explain the relevancy of your theory to the study. So this means you need to uh, unpack the relationship um, of the study or of the theory to the study and try to justify how does it fit uh, to the study and then how will it, it assist you to achieve uh, the objectives that uh, one set. So you also need to show how the research fit into the existing body of knowledge. Um, apart from summarizing and discussing the existing theories, your theoretical framework should show how your project will make use of the ideas and take them to further steps. We, we, we want one to adopt particular theory and try to contribute something out of that. It doesn't end with that particular theory. One can also come up with a framework that best suit the context that you are conducting your study in and try to show how um, this particular theory will assist you to, to ob obtain or to achieve the objectives that you set. So let's just look at uh, an, an example of um, presenting a theoretical framework uh, in a study. And then I gave an example of um, the title, Lecturer's Views on the use of technology for teaching and learning in contact university. That's the an example of the title that one can use. And then with this title, um, I have picked the social realist theory um, as a theoretical framework that um, we'll talk about in this study. And then the theory was, um, was developed by the lady Margaret Archer, uh, that was in 1995. So looking at the social realist theory, the first thing that one has to do now is to try to unpack the key theoretical aspects of this theory. So we need to know what is this theory all about or what is it based on? What are the key uh, aspects that this theory is based on? So looking at this social realist theory, um, it is based on three theoretical lenses. So the first lens that this theory is based on is structure. So the second lens is culture. And then the third lens is agency. So according to Archer, the implementation of any project is likely to be affected by these three lenses that I just uh, mentioned, the structure, culture and agency. So meaning, if we are adopting this theory as our theoretical framework, so it means our argument uh, about the lecturer's views on the use of technology for teaching and learning in a contact universities will be based on those three aspects or those three lenses. So we'll have to look at how does the structure affect the, the use of technology by lecturers, and then how is culture affect 
the use of technology uh, by lecturers. And then the last uh, lens, which is agency. How does uh, agency um, affect the use of technology for teaching and learning? So let's look at how can one apply this theory in the title that I just <coughs> mentioned. So with the application now, we need to unpack or we need to apply the relevancy of this theory using all those lenses. The three lenses that I mentioned, structure, culture, and agency. So let's look at the first uh, theoretical lens, which is structure. So in this lens, um, it will assist one to look at the university structure. If we are to talk about the use of technology, uh, the views of lecturers on the use of technology for teaching and learning, obviously the structure becomes very critical when it comes to that, because uh, when Acha talks of the structure, he's talking about the buildings, he's talking about the resources, the technological resources, the support structure that the university is having. So therefore, if we are to look at this uh, lens or this theoretical lens, you can see that it has got a great impact on the success or the failure of this integration of technology into teaching and learning. So therefore, if we are to unpack um, this lens, uh, applying it to the context of, of the study, we'll then look at the structure of the university to see if the university is having enough resources in order to, 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 to support lecturers when they are to use the technology for teaching and learning in those contact uh, university. Then we look at, do the university have enough uh, computer labs, for instance? Do they have enough equipment? What is the learning uh, management system of the university? Does it, is it act, uh, uh, active enough for lecturers to use it? Um, are le lecturers trained enough to use these learning management platforms? Those are the structural issues that one will look at. Um, and obviously, it, it already tells us if the structure is not conducive for the use of technology. So it means the implementation of this uh, use of technology for teaching and learning is likely to, to, to collapse or to fail. So therefore, this uh, theoretical lens serves as a cornerstone for the success of the integration of technology into teaching and learning. So that's the first aspect or the first lens uh, that we are trying to apply uh, in the context of this study, the structural part as articulated by Archer. Um, so the second one is around uh, culture. So with regard to culture, <clears throat> um, Archer talks about culture as one of the theoretical lens which is likely to affect um, the, the results of a particular study. So bringing it to the context of this study whereby we are looking at uh, the use of technology for teaching and learning by lecturers, then now we then look at the culture of using uh, technology. So this culture can be um, can be on the side of the students or the side of the lecturers. What are the culture in that the existing culture in that particular university? How do they feel about the use of technology for teaching and learning? Is the culture positive? Is the culture negative? Because if the culture or if the culture is negative, for instance, maybe lecturers are having attitude towards using technology for teaching and learning. So therefore, such culture is likely to affect the, the implementation of or the use of technology for teaching and learning. So culture, I mean, ICHA looks at this theoretical uh, lens as one of the influential aspects of the success of a particular a project. So is either the culture is positive or is negative according to this theoretical lens. 
and such culture is likely to influence the results of this study. So in, in applying this theoretical lens um, to the study, so for instance, if the culture is positive, so it means um, both students and lecturers will try to go extra mile to make sure of the success of this integration of technology into teaching and learning. But if the culture is negative, then they are likely to have a negative attitude towards the use of technology. And then therefore this integration of technology into teaching and learning, so it's likely to, to fail. So, so that's where the, the argument of this theoretical uh, lens is coming in. Acha um, believes that a culture is a powerful lens to influence either the success or the failure of a particular project. That's the second lens of this um, theory. And then the last one is um, agency. So in this theory, uh, Archer talks about agency as one's power to influence a particular situation. So in this case, we are talking about the agency of the university where the study is conducted. We are also talking about the agency of, or of lecturers. And then we are also talking about the agency of students as the receiving end. So this last theoretical uh, lens talks about lecturers as a as a, as a essential role to make the integration of technology either success or failure. So at the same time, also the university has also agency of supporting lecturers to provide them with workshops and on the use of the current technological equipment that are relevant for today's classroom. So, so meaning that uh, according to this theory, if we are to succeed when it comes to the implementation of uh, or the integration of technology into teaching and learning, we also need the agency of lecturers. They need to go extra mile. They need to attend those workshops in order to make it success. Students as well need to attend those trainings that are offered by ICT to try to understand how do they maneuver in the learning management system and then to try to meet lecturers halfway. So according to this theory, this lens is also important because it talks about the willingness of lecturers to make a particular project or to make the integration of technology success uh, or failure. So therefore, this theory becomes relevant for this study because it brings forth uh, those three theoretical lenses that will assist one uh, to achieve the objectives of the study, um, of which the objective of the study will be based around the success in the area of the integration of technology into, into teaching and learning. So this integration of technology or lecturer's views on integration of technology into teaching and learning um, is unpacked using all these three lenses, the structure, the culture, and the agency. So, so this is one example that, just, that I just picked just to try to unpack um, this section, the theoretical framework, to try to share with you how can one go about as you, you, you unpack the theoretical lens. Um, as I conclude, um, the theory normally helps one to design the research questions. For instance, if we go back to the social realist theory that I just gave an example with, um, if you look at those three lenses, the structure, the culture, and the agency. Already, if you are to conduct the study about this integration of technology into teaching and learning, it already gives us a, a map in what areas are we likely to ask the research questions on. For instance, we will have to talk about the structural issues as articulated in, in the theory. We need, to, we, we need to ask questions about the structure of the university 
um, if the structure is convenient enough for the lecturers to implement or to integrate technology into teaching and learning. And then it also guides us to talk about the culture, what is the attitude of you know, lecturers when it comes to the use of technology. And then it already guide us about the, the, the agency of lecturers. Are they willing to make this integration of technology success or not? So if they are not willing, and then we, we need to ask questions around that. So, so that, that is what I'm saying. Normally, it also help us to have a roadmap to say, these are the areas that one can crack in in trying to ask questions that will contribute to the, to the solution of the problem. Again, it also get us in selection of relevant data. What kind of data are we likely to 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 draw in order to unpack? Um, um, if we talk of the structure, for for instance, things such as policies of the university, ICT policies, they fall within the structure. So already, it tell you that if we can use, for instance, document analysis to try to get some policies about. The, the 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 it related or the use of technology then it also already uh, 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 suggests what kind of data can you access in order to for you to to obtain uh, to obtain what you want to 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 achieve at the end of the day and then also guide you on how to interpret your data you already have a picture on how you can um um, um, interpret your data, and then the, it also proposes the explanation of the underlying causes or the influence of the observed uh, phenomena. For instance, when we are unpicking the implementation of technology, uh, we are looking at those three lenses, the structure, the culture, and the agency. So now we already have a picture of what are the key aspects that are likely to affect or to influence your findings. So in this context, it means the structure. For if the structure is is good enough to to support lecturers to use technology, then the implementation is likely to succeed. And then if the structure is not good enough, it's likely to affect the whole implementation of technology into teaching and learning. Same applies to the culture. If the culture is positive, and then it's likely to affect. Um, the implementation of this technology and then the last aspect or theoretical lens which is agency and then okay if lecturers are not willing to go extra mile to try to make this success and then it's likely to affect the whole practice uh, this brings me to the end of this presentation and then i'll hand over to my colleague professor Anguluve, to talk about the conceptual framework thank you Okay, thank you very much and a good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, thank you for making time to come and uh, listen to us. This is a very interesting and uh, controversial uh, subject. It depends on what you are reading and uh, what uh, uh, you finally make of what you read. And, uh, I think this is the reason why Dr. Majila thought that uh, today you should actually get uh, two views of uh, the conceptual and the theoretical framework. But basically, I want us to, the most important thing is that uh, if you are going to be a graduate in South Africa and you will be the salt and the ink that uh, your certificate is written on, you need to understand these tools of research. And uh, theory is the basis uh, of those tools. But we, for the purpose of this presentation, we need to differentiate between uh, theories and, uh, and uh, conceptual frameworks. And a theoretical framework for me, it lays the foundation of theory for your study. And the conceptual framework visualizes the relationships. So the other is the foundation. As you saw, Prof Malachi gave you the foundation. 
And then uh, the other one is actually shows relationships. And they are both essential when you are doing research. And they serve different purposes, depending on how you understand them and how you use them. And I know that in your minds you are saying, can then a person use both a conceptual and a theoretical framework in one study? I will be very hesitant to have both, but uh, depending on what and how you explain them, you can have both. I always prefer to either have a conceptual framework or a theoretical framework and not both. But you can have both as long as you can uh, justify why you have uh, both. And in other words, therefore, you shouldn't just throw them in and have them in your document or in your study without uh, uh, justifying why you have both of them. And that is what I call uh, uh, theoretical transparency. So as long as you are transparent, you can have both of them. But if you cannot explain them, I think there is no point in having them and just saving them hanging there in your document. So for me, I say it's not common to have them in the study. I'm not saying it's not possible, but I'm saying it's not common. So I think by now you can see the way that we've separated the two uh, concepts, the theoretical framework and the conceptual framework. The reason why we separated the, the two presentations, it was to clearly show you, to clearly show you that they are different. There are schools of thought that think that uh, a conceptual framework and a theoretical framework are the same. And if you read in your work, you'll find that uh, that kind of thinking is very common in what I call the Stellenbosch School and uh, the British School, who actually collapse the two and they make them one. And I think they, they may have a point, but I don't think that uh, they are the same. And what you should remember is that a conceptual framework consists of the concepts, as I showed in the introduction. And uh, it is a very important aspect of your project. And uh, the question is, if you are going to focus on a theoretical framework, how about if there is no theory? Are you going to stop doing the research? Uh, maybe that is a debate that we need uh, uh, to engage in as academics to say that uh, if we say that there's a theoretical framework on one end and there's a conceptual framework on the other and uh, a theoretical framework is based on a theory, how about if there's no theory that has been uh, 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 designed to address that particular phenomenon? There are emerging uh, uh, issues in our society that maybe don't have a theory, though there is nothing new under the sun, but we may find that uh, there is no specific theory that can address that kind of issue. Then what do you do? Do you say that your study does not, a theoretic, does not have a theoretical framework, or what do you say? So I think uh, as researchers of tomorrow and emerging researchers, those are the challenging questions that I want uh, to leave you with. I won't uh, provide uh, an answer at this juncture, but I'll just uh, leave it as questions. And maybe in my approach to my presentation, you might uh, be able to get uh, a few answers here and there. And I like uh, uh, this work by Van der Waal. It is there, it's on open access, and it's there at the end of this uh, presentation. He says that uh, a theoretical framework has three core components or three core dimensions. The personal interest of the researcher, uh, the, 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 the topic or the topicality of the research or the relevance or, or any similar research or relevant research, and a theoretical framework. And uh, he, uh, Van der Waal, when talking about theoretical framework, what he is trying to say is that a conceptual framework will of essence borrow from existing theories. A theoretical framework will of essence borrow 
from the existing theories. And this is where uh, I have a, a kind of different approach when I look at a, a theoretical framework. So when you, you borrow uh, from a theory and a comb combine a conceptual framework and a theoretical framework and a personal interest of the researcher and uh, similar studies or relevant research, you end up with a conceptual framework. And therefore, this is why I think that uh, a theoretical framework of essence should actually be a theory that underpins the whole study. So the moment you select certain aspects of a theory or you select aspects of theories, you no longer have a theoretical framework. You now have a conceptual framework. So this is one thing that I want you to, to look at. And normally when I look at uh, the difference between the two, I always use this tree. This is a very popular tree in the savannah, it's the acacia tree. And in Pretoria, the town where I live in, there is even a suburb called Acacia. I don't know whether there's a lot of Acacia trees there. For me, this Acacia tree would be the theory. In other words, we take the leaves, the branches, the thorns, the trunk, and the roots. This is the theory. And on the side of the Acacia tree, we can also have a mango tree. I think most of us, we eat mangoes. So you know what a mango tree. And a mango tree, as you are aware, does not have thorns. So if you take the acacia tree and the mango tree and combine them, I don't think that you come up with a tree. You come up with something which is a hybrid of a tree. And that hybrid for me cannot be called a tree. It has to be called by another name. And in my uh, definition, I call that a conceptual framework. But if I remove the mango tree and I remain with my acacia tree, and I use all the components of an acacia tree, where I, I, I do agree with the Professor Malachi that a, a, a theory or a theoretical framework can help you to frame your research questions. So my research questions will be framed around the branches, around the thorns, around the roots. So I've got my three research questions that cover my acacia tree. But now if I bring in the mango tree, obviously that complicates the matter. And therefore that kind of co contaminates my theory. And that contamination uh, gives a different outcome as far as I'm concerned. And that outcome is a conceptual framework. Now we have got a number of components that I'm going to take from a mango tree and the components I'm going to take from an acacia tree in order to have uh, a conceptual framework for my study. So I want you to think about it in those practical terms. You say to yourself, am I using a conceptual framework or am I using a theoretical framework? For me, if you are going to use all the components of an acacia tree, then you are using a theoretical framework. But if you are going to use the certain components of an acacia tree, like these components I am depicting here, you can't say these pieces of uh, uh, parts or these components of an acacia tree is a tree. Or some of you, I think you have grown up uh, in a rural area like myself where you use firewood. I know these days uh, there are more sophisticated rural areas where you now use gas and you also use the uh, electricity if there's no load shedding. But with load shedding, I think you still go back to the roots where we use the firewood. You can't say when you put a, 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 a number of pieces of, of wood in a, in, a, in a fireplace. You can't say I have a tree in a fireplace. You say that I've got pieces of wood in a fireplace. In other words, you have a concept from a tree in a fireplace, which is your conceptual 
framework. So that's how I, I actually understand a conceptual framework. So how then do you construct a conceptual framework? You look at your title. And I say, I think it is the same kind of approach that you also use when you are actually looking at your theoretical framework. You look at your title and say, what are, are the key components of this research problem? And then you break them down. After breaking them down, you say, is there a theory that addresses all these components together? And if you, don't, if you don't find a theory that addresses all those components together, then you go for a conceptual framework. That's how I see it. So you identify the concepts in the title, and you read the relevant uh, literature, and you identify related con concepts using authoritative sources. And then from there, you construct a basic com conceptual framework. And every time you have a conceptual framework, you must remember that you must represent it grammatically. And in most cases, the, the simpler way we use boxes and arrows. Boxes uh, uh, arrange in a sequence and arrows pointing to these boxes showing relationships. And they are also showing relationships in the direction of the relationship. So these are the most commonest ways that we use by when we are construct, constructing a conceptual framework. If we were meeting face to face and uh, we had uh, 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 a flip chart to actually do the exercise, I was going to take one of your, 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 your research topics or your titles and then look at the concepts, then try to draw the boxes around. So you can just try and draw the boxes at random to start with. Just draw them without any order. Then as you read, you can reorder. These days it's easier because you've got uh, laptops and computers. During our time, we were, using, we, were used, we were used to paper. There were no laptops and we, there were typewriters, actually. So you wouldn't construct it on a typewriter. So you now move the boxes around in order to depict the relationship. So that is how you construct uh, your conceptual framework using... Uh, your literature, and also using your experience. And for me, the experience and your context are very, very important. I know we talked about this uh, uh, theory, and my question would be, does this theory address all context? Does uh, the, the whole point of agency, does it turn out or does it manifest itself the same way in every context? And I think you'll agree with me. The answer is no. So if the answer is no, for me, therefore, in research, all existing theories, they cannot fully help us to explain a phenomenon, especially in the uh, indigenous and the developing world context. I have a problem with existing theories because these theories, most of them, they were actually uh, designed in contexts that don't talk to our context. And this is why, actually, uh, we are sitting here today in front of you, uh, professing the knowledge that we have, and the world has not changed from where we found it. The world is still as bad as it was. Why? Because we are producing knowledge that is not relevant. And for me, to produce knowledge that is relevant, we need actually to use conceptual frameworks. Because for me, conceptual frameworks, they recognize that uh, knowledge does not exist in a vacuum. They recognize that there are theories that have been uh, uh, formulated, but these theories, they don't completely and comprehensively address our problems. And therefore, we cannot use them as our theoretical framework. We can use them as our basis of uh, uh, constructing our conceptual framework. We can take aspects from them, like uh, even the culture itself. We, we saw that uh, in the previous presentation by Professor Malachi, 
uh, the theory had uh, three aspects. The culture uh, was one of them. The structure was one of them, I think, and the, the agents was one of them. And let me talk of culture that we are all familiar with. We will discover that uh, uh, culture, even within South Africa, there are many cultures. And our culture of using technology or even any other uh, technology for that better, they will depend on our context. So for me, the context becomes very important. And for us, and for if we are going to uh, uh, say we are researchers and we want to uh, construct knowledge and uh, produce knowledge that is going to make a change, we can't make a change by using uh, those theories. And hence, I would actually uh, recommend that we all gravitate towards a, a conceptual framework, which actually uh, does recognize that you borrow from the theories, you borrow from your context, you borrow from your experiences, and then models and uh, other literature to come up with uh, uh, a foundation of your research. And hence, this is uh, how I think you can uh, formulate your conceptual framework. I think indeed, Prof Malachi said that uh, you can actually borrow from a number of uh, theories. Uh, to come up with a theoretical framework. But for me, once you borrow from a number of theories, like when you borrow from a mango tree and an acacia tree, you cannot uh, end up with an acacia tree. You will end up with something hybrid, which is something whether it's a, a, a mango cassia or a cassia mango. It can be a cash, an acacia or a mango. So therefore, it cannot be a theoretical framework in my own way of uh, uh, looking at things. As I said in my... Uh, preface. This is an area which uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, differences in terms of uh, understanding and approach as to what uh, uh, the, the 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 two terms constitute. And as I said, it depends on what literature you are reading. And they let your literature uh, inform you. And they, in being informed by that literature, you must be consistent. When you decide to say, I'm going to use the term conceptual framework where I combine a number of theories, then be consistent with that. Don't uh, move between a conceptual framework and a theoretical framework, because well, that can confuse the reader. So for me, you can put uh, two theories together and they get all the components. You remember that uh, uh, in Prof. Malachi's uh, illustration, he showed you that his study has got three questions. Uh, each question addressing each component of the theory, which is a very powerful way of actually uh, theorizing. And then the same applies to a conceptual framework. So if you have got research questions, if you start from the research questions, like at times in, 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 in qualitative research, you start with a, a hunch or you start with the research questions without any theory. And you find the theories to address those hunches or those uh, uh, research questions as we go back. So you can start off with uh, five research questions, then you discover that uh, like the theory that we're given by Prof. Malachi, it has got three, three constructs, and those three constructs only address three of your constructs, and the two remain unaddressed. So you look for another theory to address those remaining two constructs. And for me, what you end up with will be a conceptual framework rather than a theoretical framework. But I wouldn't want to discuss this whole diagram because you are going to get these slides uh, from Dr. Majila and uh, the literature at the end of this uh, uh, presentation. If you make a, a snowball approach and uh, uh, go to those uh, uh, referenced sources, you are going to get uh, this diagram somewhere along the line. The diagram, the, the circle that I want us to focus on is number three. I think you realize that from my presentation, I said that uh, uh, we see far because we have stood on the shoulders of giants. And the shoulders of giants, so don't, the shoulders of giants are the existing knowledge, the existing uh, uh, theories. And indeed, if you remember Van der Waals, uh, example, and I, I told you Van der Waals, uh, um uh, work is there at the end of this uh, uh, presentation. Van Avald says that uh, a conceptual framework has got three core dimensions. 
And one of those dimensions is the theoretical framework. And I say the interpretation of that dimension of the theoretical framework is it means that any conceptual framework must have an element of, a, of an existing theory. So there's nothing saying that you, you are going to start from scratch. I know that there are people who, who believe that they start from scratch, and they also, I, I don't really agree with them, because in this world, there's nothing new, and there's no one who is bringing in a new thing, and there's no one who is bringing in a, 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 a thing that we don't know. But what you are doing is you are presenting that, new th that thing in a new way, with the new dimensions, maybe in terms of methodology, maybe in terms of uh, the theory that you are using, maybe even in terms of the context where you are applying that uh, new thing or new phenomenon. So, so therefore, second number three recognizes that uh, there should be existing knowledge. You can't start from zero. There is the existing knowledge. I know some people, uh, when they look at, for example, the, the grounded theory movement, which was started by the Chicago School in uh, 1967, where they wanted to pretend that uh, you can have a clean slate. There's nothing called a, a clean slate. Because once you have a slate, obviously that slate uh, came from a context. It is not as clean. It's always related to the context where it came from. So it can be totally uh, clean. It will be uh, related and connected to the context where it came from. So there's nothing called a, a clean slate in my own thinking, which is my view, of course. And uh, you may, you are also entitled to your own view, and especially those of you who are doing PhD. That's the kind of thinking that I want you to have, to be controversial, because you are now philosophers. Because uh, a PhD means that you are a doctor of philosophy, and you need to philosophize and problematize these things, and not just take theories also and retail, retail and apply them. And if you mark the... Uh, Prof. Maslach's word, he said, theories are not universal. So if they are not universal, it means that obviously we should actually question their basis and uh, their assumptions. And once we start uh, questioning their assumptions, we go back uh, to my corner, which is the conceptual framework. Because we are now saying this theory, yes, it is there, but where was it formulated? What context was it addressing? Is it addressing my context? Yes, it may apply to my context, but my context is very unique. That's why every time when we, you say, I'm doing a study, we say, give us the site. Where are you going to do the study? And that where is very, very important because it shows you that this is the context. Like if I am sitting here in Pretoria and someone sitting in Umtabi Alingan, our contexts are very different. Even when you look, look at the simple phenomenon of load shedding, the way that we are affected by load shedding, yes, load shedding means the disappearance of lights, of, of electricity, but the impact of the disappearance of electricity in Umtabi Alingana and the in Pretoria, where I'm sitting now, they will be different. So you can't use the same theory of load shedding in Umtabi Alingana up there in Wazul Natal and, the Umta, and, the, and, the, and the down here in Pretoria. So this is where I'm trying to show you that if you are operating in cycle number three, Therefore, you are likely to incorporate aspects of a theory and a concept from the literature and your personal experience and a knowledge of the context. But the knowledge of the context is very, very important. And at the moment, in fact, it is very important for us as researchers to actually always look at our context so that we produce knowledge that actually tries to promote uh, the needs and the problems of our context. So this is how you can look at it when you get uh, this presentation to say uh, Uprof was lamenting or was uh, advocating for the third uh, circle as compared to all the other circles. And I know that there are supervisors who still uh, are in the old age where they will tell you that uh, uh, as a student, you don't have an opinion. And, uh, and for me, I don't think that is a very fair uh, kind of approach. Because see, no one is trying to clone you. And the reason why, as I said, we, we are not progressing is because of this mentality that I say, use the theories that I used when I was a student. And we continue to use those theories without even questioning them. And we, and they, we, we just produce uh, 
PhDs that uh, stay on the shelves, and those PhDs, they don't change our society, and we remain poor, underdeveloped, we remain hungry, and et cetera, and et cetera, because we are not using appropriate theories. And this is why I say, come to my corner, let's do, let's have a conceptual framework and construct it the way we have done. I have looked at uh, uh, an area which I think everyone uh, in our meetings to you analyze data and uh, you report data. And I was looking at the uh, uh, improving the quality of reporting findings using computer data analysis. Actually, this is a published paper, but uh, I thought it could uh, be an example that can uh, resonate with everybody in the audience. So I am trying to look at improving the quality of reporting findings using computer data analysis. So my phenomenon, as far as I'm concerned, is technology. How do I use technology to improve the quality of reporting findings? We may agree, we disagree on what the research question can be, but that's how I've formulated myself, say, how can we use technology to improve the quality of reporting findings? That's my question. And the context is an educational research context. But I don't want to use another context because I find that other contexts may use different uh, technologies. So you see, so my uh, uh, solution here or my findings, they may not apply to other contexts. They may not be generalized to other contexts. That's why I'm saying the context that I want to improve is an educational one. So I'm saying, how then do you use technology to report, uh, how to improve the quality of reporting findings? That's my research question. I know that I've uh, I've uh, done it as step number three, and I've uh, projected the question in a, in a different format. But that is the essence of the question. If you agree with me, no, I I, I was say, going to say indicate in the chat, but I know you don't that have, you don't have that functionality. So maybe next time when we have the functionality, we can chat. Uh, they have step number four, and therefore we now have the theoretical foundation. I go back to Van der Waals, uh, uh, framework, that there must be a theoretical framework, the theoretical foundation that can inform this research. And uh, am I going to use a conceptual framework or a theoretical framework? And I'm saying that the methodology and then the research question will determine whether or not you can use a conceptual framework or a theoretical framework. So when I looked in the literature, I said, what technology, how can technology be used to enhance the quality of reporting findings? So therefore, I want to see the, uh, my context is the educational research. So I want to see how people in the research are, uh, in the educational research context, can use technology to enhance the quality of their reporting. And when I check in the literature, I identify two theories that uh, are actually are talking about technology. And that is also one important thing that you should actually uh, bear in mind, that when you choose a theory, you must actually demonstrate whether it is the only theory or there are other theories that you can choose from. And then if there are other theories that you can choose from, why this theory and not in others? I think it's just like with your methodology these days, I think you are very much aware that if you say I'm going to use qualitative, uh, the qualitative uh, research methodology, some people think that I'm using qualitative research methodology because it's easy, I'm not going to be doing any figures and statistics. But that's not the reason why we choose methodology. So the same applies with theories. It's not that because the, your lecturer is a, uh, a recommended theory, then you're going to use it. Or some people have used it, then they're going to use it. The question is, you must actually motivate. 
So when I looked at technology, I identified two theories. One theory was the diffusion of innovation theory. You will agree with me that the use of computers is a diffusion of innovation. And then I looked at the other theory, which is the technology adoption model. And you agree with me using, using computers is actually uh, adopting a technology. Then I said, okay, what are the, uh, what are the, are the components of these theories? I looked at uh, TAM, which is technology adoption model. And I, 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 I realized that it says usage depends on the attitude of the user towards usefulness and the ease of use. You see, that's what the theory says. So there must be a user for this model to apply. So it means that I must ask people questions to find out their attitudes towards uh, computer computers in analyzing data and how computers can help them to enhance the quality of their data. That's what that means. And then the, the, the other one, the diffusion of innovation uh, theory, it has got uh, uh, three components. In, the innovation itself, the communication channels involved. Already when you say the communication channels involved, it takes us to the technology adoption model because it needs us to talk to people. But unfortunately, my methodology here, I'm not talking to people. I am looking at documents, that is, theses that are produced by uh, people that have researched uh, uh, educational context. So if I'm going to look at theses, there's no way I can talk to them to say, what was your behavioral intention? There's no way I can talk to them to say, what were your 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 communication channels. So it means that uh, these two theories, they don't really fully address or they don't address uh, my, my uh, research question. But to some extent, uh, theory number one, the diffusion of innovation theory, it does, but there is an innovation itself. The innovation here is the technology, which is the computer. So therefore, I'm going to say, therefore, I am going to use that aspect of that theory, the innovation itself. And then I'm going to use my context and the context of using computers to come up with a conceptual framework. So I will not use TAM because TAM needs a different methodology to the methodology I'm using. And the concepts that are in the innovations, in the diffusion of innovation theory, I may not use all of these concepts because some of them, they also need me to talk to people. So the methodology I'm using, because I'm only using uh, content analysis of documents, I cannot use it, but I can only use one aspect, which is innovation itself. And then I'll look at my personal experience and I'll also look at the literature and I'm also going to look at the context. Then I'll come up with my conceptual framework. So that's how we come up with a conceptual framework. And I know that... Uh, uh, you are tired of uh, uh, hearing my voice, so I think uh, I should now uh, draw this uh, discussion to an end and probably give you uh, time uh, to uh, ask questions and uh, time maybe to engage. And that is the problem also of this online uh, platform. It is quite uh, uh, innovative and uh, 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 reaches a lot of people like in a Cordell environment, but the problem is that people tend to just listen and go away without in, engaging. But in conclusion, therefore, I would say a theoretical framework provides a foundation of existing theories, offering a broad lenses through which the research is viewed. And then on the other hand, a conceptual framework focuses on specific concepts and variables. And these concepts and variables they may actually be found in the theories and they guide the data analysis and the data collection. And I'm saying uh, in the environment where we are, where we have very few theories that have been developed, we need actually to be uh, using more of conceptual frameworks than theoretical frameworks because uh, uh, if we use an existing theory, in most cases, we are trying to either test the theory uh, uh, without actually uh, developing new theories uh, from it. 
And that, in my view, does not lead to the development of a discipline, or let alone the maturity of a discipline. So, but if you develop a conceptual framework, a conceptual framework is going to lead to broad explanations about the phenomenon, and these broad explanations can be the you can be used as a basis of theory testing. In that way, uh, theories in a certain subject or domain will increase and uh, knowledge is going also to increase and uh, we are going to produce knowledge that is going to change our society. And uh, my uh, ending statement is my signature uh, uh, saying, which says a, a bird does not sing because it is an answer. It sings because it is a song. And uh, this is from an old Chinese proverb. And uh, this is my song, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you for listening to my song. And over to you, uh, Chairperson.